Hello and welcome back to another episode of Talking Ball with Pat Leonard. I am the New York Daily News' NFL columnist and Giants beat writer. The Giants are 6-1. and one. The NFL season turned on its head. The trade deadline is upcoming. Already have been some intriguing moves centered around running back of all positions. Christian McCaffrey going from the Panthers to the San Francisco 49ers who essentially did that to prevent him from going to the Rams as well as upgrade their own team. And the New York Jets trading for James Robinson from the Jaguars, the running back after losing Brees Hall to a season-ending injury. We are going to have the Daily News' Antoine Staley, the Jets beat writer, join us once again because New York football is at an all-time high, it feels like, compared to what it's been in recent years. And we need to dive in to everything going on with the Jets, both positive positive. And dramatic because it always feels like there's something crazy going on in Florham Park. But I wanted to start off with some bold predictions, if you will, from what we've seen in the NFL in the last several weeks, some intriguing storylines to keep an eye on and some developments, I believe, that are coming down the pike. And my first bold prediction is that Chris Ballard and Frank Reich in Indianapolis have reason to be concerned about their job security. Now, this isn't a report as much as it's reading what I see from that organization's behavior. And that is, and having covered an organization that functions like this myself, I see a team and a franchise where the owner, Jim Ursay, believed his team was better than it was and is reacting accordingly to the disappointment that he is seeing from his club. Now, Reich and Ballard were extended already a year ago through the 2026 season. So they have long-term contracts locked in. It's no secret that they are respected around the league as both an evaluator in Ballard and a coach in Reich. But there's also no question that the Colts have been a tremendous disappointment. Not that I didn't see it coming, but I think a lot of people believed, including Reich and Ballard, that they were going to be able to incorporate Matt Ryan into a run-heavy offense that was going to bring out the best in him and the team. And when I hear Frank Reich, when they announce that they are moving permanently from Matt Ryan, who is injured, but moving permanently regardless to Sam Ellinger at quarterback. And then I hear Reich say, we haven't held up our side of the bargain, our end of the bargain with Matt Ryan. We believed we could support him well, and we have failed him in that regard. I'm hearing a coach who wishes he did not have to make this move. I'm hearing a coach and a general manager who, after consulting with Jim Ursay, as they said they did, this decision was made. And the fact of the matter is, despite some of the great draft picks Ballard has made, and despite some of the successes Reich has had as a coach and how much he is revered as a leader and a play caller, the fact is that Ballard's record as a general manager now in his sixth season is 44-43-1. and And the Colts have been to two playoffs in that time. They've only won one playoff game. They're one and two. And that was when Andrew Luck was their quarterback. I have always thought since the day that Andrew Luck retired abruptly that Ballard was handed the short end of the stick. And you can see that the Colts have not recovered since. They've gone through Jacoby Brissett, Phillip Rivers, Carson Wentz, Matt Ryan, To me, though, it's not a blameless mistake now this deep since Luck retired prior to 2019 on the part of Ballard's because you have to evaluate what your team is and isn't. The Los Angeles Rams have done a good job of understanding that they had a window and they had to go get it. The Colts thought they had a window all these years. They went and got quarterbacks who they weren't developing for the long term. These were guys like starting with Rivers, for example, They thought we are good enough if we plug in a solid veteran that we are going to the playoffs, we are going to win games, and we are going to challenge for a Super Bowl. Now, they haven't been a bad team year in and year out, but their evaluation of where they were and who they were was never accurate. And they also were taking half measures at quarterback when you needed to do a complete and full look at that position and a redevelopment, so to speak, of your offense and of your game plan. Reich also went to back, went to bat for Carson Wentz. And listen, you can understand why Reich, with his history with Carson going back to Philadelphia, why he thought he could get the best out of him again. 
And let's just face it, Wentz was, before his injury, the year the Eagles won the Super Bowl, at the moment he got hurt, he was the best player in the NFL that season at that time. He was playing as the MVP of that year prior to his injury. So I can understand where Reich and the Colts were coming from. But this starts at the top. It starts with Jim Irsay. And I think when you have an owner who gets restless and listen, in the NFL, that's all we see now. We basically saw a third of the NFL turn over at the head coaching position this past offseason. The reason? Because there's never been less patience. And the Colts, compared to the rest of the league, have shown a lot of steadiness in these roles. Ballard's in year six. Frank Reich is in year five. Um, and I think that there are a lot of good qualities about the Colts organization, and everything starts with leadership in the NFL. But they're three, three, and one. When I when you read the reports of the local beat reporters covering the Colts, you see that this decision to bench Matt Ryan and to replace him with Sam Ellinger was in the works for several weeks. This was not simply in reaction to this loss to the Titans. This was just the last straw. And they were grooming and developing a plan to replace him early once they saw not only that Ryan was turning the ball over, that they weren't winning as many games as they wanted, but that the team around him was not as good as they thought they were, starting with the offensive line that's been one of the best in the NFL year in and year out. You know, Ballard obviously picking Quentin Nelson was a major deal. So I think this is a bigger situation to keep an eye on than simply a quarterback change and even a an apparent um, acceptance of that this isn't our year and we should, you know, Try to win games, but we also won't be upset if we get a higher draft pick. The question to me is, will Chris Ballard be making that draft pick? I think that's a fair question to ask right now. And I think my prediction for this situation is that it's something to keep an eye on. Like I said, Ballard was – no GM has dealt with something more difficult, unexpected, and brutal from a personnel standpoint than Ballard with Andrew Luck's retirement. I mean, the Colts just simply have never recovered. So would it be fair if Ballard was not the GM who made the pick next spring? Maybe not. But there have been opportunities since to reevaluate, regroup, and build this thing in a way that it looked much more positive and less stagnant than it does now. And that hasn't happened. So something to keep an eye on there in Indianapolis. My next prediction it centers around the New England Patriots quarterback controversy, and that's exactly what it is. Mac Jones, Bailey Zappi, Bill Belichick clearly refusing to put his full support behind Mac Jones when asked about who's his starting quarterback and where do things stand. But my bold prediction here is that this is much simpler than people are making it out to be. And listen, this is a controversy, not playing that down at all. But I think my bold prediction here is that Bill Belichick is going to play the quarterback who doesn't turn the ball over. I think it's as simple as that. You watch this loss to the Chicago Bears, and you see that Mac Jones comes out of the game when? When he throws that interception off his back foot. He throws the interception. First down of the next drive, Bailey Zappi's in. Mac Jones is out. Bailey Zappi finishes. Now Zappi throws two interceptions in the second half as well. So it could be Mac Jones starting the next game again. But when Belichick says that both quarterbacks were going to play in this game and that was the plan going in, obviously it's a little fishy when some of the players say they didn't know that. But you can tell when you watch this team, the Patriots are not built to win games when they turn the ball over more than once. Mac Jones's problem this year, now he has the injury now, but Mac Jones has committed seven turnovers in four starts. He has thrown six interceptions. Bailey Zappi now has committed six turnovers in two starts and four appearances, and he's got three and three, three interceptions, three fumbles now. The Patriots are three and four. When they commit one turnover in the game from the quarterback position, they are three and one. When they commit more than one turnover at the quarterback's position, they are 0 oh and three. They have forced 13 takeaways on defense. They are tied for third in the NFL 
for the most takeaways by a defense. But this team is built to win by capitalizing on those turnovers and those takeaways and field position, good running game, disciplined play, and opportunistic shots by the quarterback. They are not built to win turning the ball over at the quarterback position. They're not built that way. And I think that even though there could be more drama spilling out of this with you know, whether it's a player's representation getting frustrated, you've seen some leaks come from the Mac Jones side. Um, you know, Bill Belichick's handling of this, whether that rubs the locker room the wrong way and backfires, that's something to keep an eye on. As far as who is going to play, I think this is very simple. I think Bill Belichick tried to give Mac Jones his job back and is willing to give Mac Jones his job back, but you could see based on his behavior in that game, benching him. And based on how Mac Jones has started this season, that Belichick's emphasis is you will play, but if you commit bad turnovers and put us at a disadvantage, you will not. And I think it's as simple as that. The Patriots, by the way, have ample opportunity to bounce back here at Jets against the Colts by week and then home against the Jets as well. The Jets obviously five and two, but with some key injuries and no recent success against their division rival. Now for my boldest prediction, I think. My bold prediction is that Saquon Barkley could break two records. He could break in one of the next Giants three games, Tiki Barber's team rushing record for a single game. Tiki Barber ran for 234 yards against Washington on December 30th, 2006. That is the team record. Saquon Barkley's right shoulder isn't right. I would not be shocked. I don't know this, but I would not be shocked if he is managing severe pain week in and week out. It's one of those injuries or tears or whatever it is where it can't get any worse and you know require surgery after the season. That wouldn't shock me. I, I don't know that, but I'm just based on his behavior, being limited in practice, how he reacts when he takes a hit to it. And that was part of the reason I didn't think he would thrive against Jacksonville. But then you see they lean on him heavily. He has 110 rushing yards and the Giants bowl over Jacksonville and improved to six and one. They are going up against in these next three games, the Seahawks, the Texans, and the Lions. And wouldn't you know, those are the NFL's worst three rushing defenses. They face the Seahawks first. The Seahawks are the 30th rushing defense in the league out of 32 teams. They give up 149.7 rush yards per game. Then after their bye week, they face the Houston Texans, who are giving up 164.7 rush yards per game. That is dead last in the NFL. Then they play the Detroit Lions, who are giving up 162.8 rush yards per game. That is 31st, second to worst. Saquon Barkley could break Tiki Barber's single game rushing record of 234 yards in one of those games. I don't think it's crazy to say that. The one factor that could impact it negatively, of course, is that Evan Neal and Ben Bredesen, the right tackle and left guard, are out and are going to miss some time. So that could work against Barkley's opportunity to do what I'm predicting he could do. That said, Josh Azudu, the left guard, the rookie, has he had some struggles and growing pains? Sure. But his run blocking, especially when he's pulling on those power runs that they used against Jacksonville, has been solid. And Tyree Phillips, listen, you you concern yourself more with pass protection than run blocking typically with backup offensive linemen. Run blocking, especially when the Giants simplify their concepts, is much uh, more direct of an approach than pass protection and being on an island that way. So I think that it's not out of the question to think that Barkley not only is going to have some big games here coming up, but that he could snap Barber's record based on how he's been running and playing. And my other bold prediction about Barkley is this. He could break Tiki Barber's single season Giants record for all purpose yards as well. Now that's a little bit more difficult because Tiki had 2,390 yards um, all purpose. That's his record. And he also holds all four of the top four records for the Giants all-purpose yards in a season, by the way. 
Barkley is fifth, though, going back to his rookie year. He went over 2000, 2028 to be exact. And his pace, it's not out of the question he does it, especially if he erupts in these three games against some favorable rush defenses. So Saquon leads the NFL in all-purpose yards right now with 906 through seven games. And the Giants have 10 games left. So he's averaging 129.4 yards per game total, rushing and receiving. If he averages 148.5 the rest of the way, he would get the 1485 needed to break Barber's record. Now, obviously, that's going to be difficult. You have to stay healthy. You have to run it up against some of the really favorable matchups coming up because it's going to be, of course, probably more difficult to find sledding down the stretch, especially you're playing the Eagles twice, you play the Cowboys again. So no guarantee. But I just think it's we're at the point of the season now based on Barkley's consistent production and the way the Giants run their offense. I don't think it's crazy to say that we could be looking at a guy who could break both of Barber's records, single game rushing and single season all-purpose yards coming up here. Must see TV if you're watching the NFL and you're watching the Giants. And my final prediction is this. The NFL trade deadline is going to continue to be um, crazy. Things are going to pop. There are going to be deals. There are more sellers than people anticipated a couple weeks ago. Uh, The deadline is Tuesday, November 1st at 4 p.m. Some things to keep an eye out for. Wanted to give a shout out to Brad Stainbrook, Stainbrook from the Orange and Brown Report in Cleveland. Uh, he was the first one to report that Kareem Hunt, the Browns running back, is on the block. And that is a significant development because we've seen Christian McCaffrey and James Robinson already get traded to teams and offloaded. And running back is hot right now. <laughs> who would have Who would have thought that? And there are teams out there who could very much use a player like Hunt, who obviously is in a tandem there, but not the lead back in Cleveland, but is built for being a lead back somewhere. That is a name to look out for. Um, the, The Rams obviously can never be discounted. They are in sweepstakes every time this year. They are continuing to try to hammer that window. It'll be interesting to see if they can get some offensive line help. That's something that is difficult usually to get mid-season, but they are decimated up front, and that is their major need. They were in it up to the end with Christian McCaffrey and the 49ers, though, and so they have been looking. Obviously, Cam Akers is a guy they're trying to offload who wants a trade, and so running back and the Rams are something to watch out for. Jordan Rodriguez from The Athletic also reported, and this is a big name that popped up, Bradley Chubb. Uh, multiple reports have said that the Denver Broncos and Bradley Chubb, they could be selling their pass rusher there. And Jordan from The Athletic reported that the Rams very much should be and likely will be in the edge rusher, pass rusher market leading up to the deadline, and that Chubb would make a lot of sense for them. So that would obviously, obviously be a major splash. They, of course, brought in Von Miller last year. Miller now gone to Buffalo. So nothing surprising there. Uh, but significant, it would be a major, major play by Les Snead, who makes them seemingly every month, every year, for sure. Um, the Broncos in general, I think, are a team to look out for. I've heard Jerry Judy's name, a wide receiver. I think K.J. Hamler, too. Uh, this These are a position group and guys who are being underutilized. This organization has been a tremendous disappointment at the quarterback position, at the head coaching position, and these are players who can help teams. So, Skill players, running back, but then receiver as well. The Broncos should be looked at as sellers. The Colts should be looked at as potential sellers based on this decision at quarterback. The Panthers have said they're not having a fire sale, but they certainly have some veteran contracts that they might look to move off of as they kind of retool. It won't be a full rebuild because they have so much young talent. They should not trade, but they are certainly retooling that roster and getting some contracts off the books. And Chase Claypool, obviously, from Pittsburgh is also a wide receiver who is an excellent, excellent player, especially down the field, on the outside, big body, tough, great hands. Uh, It's just not working out in Pittsburgh. And you can see uh, that he is going to be somebody who will clearly help someone. Obviously, the Green Bay Packers are a team who they look like they need receiver help. They've needed receiver help ever since Devontae Adams ended up with the Raiders. 
uh, be intriguing to see how Brian Gutekunst and Mike and Matt LaFleur operate though, given how disappointing and how far their offense and their team has fallen, do they, do they still load up looking for expectations in 2022 to come to for fruition or do they stand pat knowing that Rogers is likely on his way out? Um, and this is not something where they need to commit huge assets to a player knowing that next year they're going to be in a rebuild phase of sorts. Uh, so that's something definitely to keep an eye on the, as for the giants, the Giants have only around $3 million or so in salary cap space. It remains more likely if they make a move that they would be making a signing of a cheap veteran versus making a trade. They really can't take on much in terms of contracts. Uh, if they do, I think obviously the receiver position on the outside is where they have to do it. I think Daniel Jones has earned the right to have some more support and more talent on the outside to kind of help him and boost this offense because of where the Giants have put themselves now. The Giants just have to be strategic about how much they commit in a trade like that. So not out of the question that they would go and look at a pl at a player like Claypool, let's say, um, in Pittsburgh, but you have to be strategic about uh, – now he's on a rookie contract, so that's something that could be favorable to look at. There's no question about it. But as of this moment, I think the Giants, Joe Shane continually says he's open for business. The receiver position remains the one to watch. It's one that they've tried to address a lot. They have, um, throughout the offseason, we're looking to offload some of their own receivers. Uh, Cole Beasley has been a name to keep an eye on. Odell Beckham Jr. has been a name to keep an eye on. So uh, they just don't have a lot of means. You know, a team like the Cleveland Browns, if they trade Kareem Hunt, even though he carries some money, the Browns have enough salary cap space where they could eat some of Hunt's salary in order to get the contract done and the trade done. The Giants don't have that space, so they have to get creative. Uh, but I definitely think it's worth pushing and pushing the suggestion on Joe Shane and the Giants that even if it doesn't happen at the deadline, once you're in a position like this, where you're in the driver's seat and you have, you're tied for the most wins in the NFL, you have to keep your ears and eyes open to upgrading things because Daniel Jones is putting his best foot forward. He's the NFC's offensive player of the week, reigning from week seven, and you just have to give him more weapons clearly to get it done. So keep an eye on all that. Keep an eye on the deadline coming up, and we're going to shift over to our guest, Antoine Staley, the Jets beat writer from the New York Daily News. All right, we're back with a guest who brought it last time. So he's coming back on the show. He's Antoine Staley, Daily News Jets beat writer. Antoine, thanks for coming back, man. Hey, thanks for having me, man. I appreciate it. Yeah, you got it, man. I, I have no choice. I mean, New York football is king right now. We haven't seen this in so long. Uh, obviously, me with the Giants, but the Jets just keep winning as well. So I wanted to dive right in because not only is your team winning, they also, to me, are just one of the most interesting teams in the league. I feel like there's so many different storylines and something's happening every day. And I wanted to get your inside opinion and analysis and all on everything that's happening. So let's start with the most current news. Sauce Gardner, AFC Defensive Player of the Week. Why has Sauce been so good and why did he earn this record or earn this award this week? I mean, he's already a top 10 corner in the league. I mean, like it's just it's crazy to think about a rookie coming in and producing the way that he has. But, I mean, he has everything you want in a cornerback. I mean, he's tall. He's lanky. He's, you know, he can tackle. I mean, he's great at coverage. I mean, even if he's, like, behind a receiver, he has enough, like, length and also speed to be able to catch up with him and deflect balls and bat them away. Like, once, only thing he's not doing is bringing out interceptions. Once he starts doing that, I mean – it might be game over for a lot of these receivers in the league too. But I mean, he's been exceptional and uh, just tremendous. And I think right now, really the, the leader in the clubhouse when it comes to defensive rookie of the year, at least in my opinion. Yeah, no, you're right. The inter If the interceptions start coming, that actually might be where they stop throwing at him. Right. <laughs> you know, yeah. and uh, was it, was he following Cortland Sutton around the field on Sunday? Yeah. For the most part. Yeah. I mean, they usually mm -hmm. keep him on like one side of the field, but yeah, they, you know, sometimes it was Judy too at times, but yeah, Corlin Sutherland was uh, mainly his main, you know, guy he was keeping covered of. And I want to ask you too. I was watching some of the highlights. Um, is Sauce handsy as a corner, and his is he almost um, 
It reminds me of kind of how the Seahawks and Legion of Boom used to like dare the officials to call it. Like they weren't dragging guys down, but they kind of had their hands on them all the way to the last minute. Is that his style or was was he just kind of playing uh, Sutton that way this week because, you know, big body guy? He's always a he's been a physical corner, even going back to college. Like he always kind of he uses his big body kind of just to put his hands on wide receivers there. And, you know, he sometimes, you know, the refs call it, sometimes they don't. But I think he's getting so good to the point where refs are like, yeah, you know, he's just, <laughs> you know, we're not going to call some of that stuff because we don't feel like it's necessarily affecting, you know, the play, the outcome of the play. But, yeah, he's wow. definitely very handsly and very touchy-feely uh, <laughs> as far as receivers. I know a lot of people were in my mentions on Sunday talking about uh, it should have been a pass interference call on him because he was – you know, putting his hands on the receiver's uh, shoulders. But, you know, it's not really affecting the play. He's just – that's just the type of corner he is. Well, you make a good point too. Like if he if he has already set the standard for officials, like, oh, no, this is just how he plays, right, because he's on the line but he's not crossing it. Once you get there, that's how you become locked down, right? Because if the officials say, well, he's he plays it clean, he just plays hard and he plays physical, they give you that – then you're just not going to see as many flags come out. And that's, wow, what a, what a pick for the Jets so far and what a start for him. But let's shift, too, to the big picture here, Antoine, because the Jets are buyers right now. They're trading for players to upgrade a 5-2 and two roster. It always feels like they're the sellers. They're the team offloading players. When they trade for James Robinson from the Jaguars, what does that mean for the offense and the team? as far as like football is concerned, but also what did it signal to you that they went out and got a player like that when Brees Hall went down? Well, I mean, it shows that they want to still keep the same identity and that's running the football, continue to play good defense and special teams. When Brees Hall was there right before his injury, that's what they were doing. That was really the, you know, the mindset of their offense, just really to run the football with him and, you know, have Michael Carter do some split carries too with him at times, but while they're still trying to develop in this passing game and find, have his find his way. Now, you know, obviously Brees Hall went down, you know, catastrophic ACL injury out for the season, mm-hmm. you know, you like they like Michael Carter, but they still want somebody. They don't want him to take a bulk of the carries. So why not bring in somebody that's, you know, in Jacksonville? You know, he's kind of. I mean, you saw he didn't play hardly against the uh, against yeah. the Giants uh, last Sunday. You know, it was really Travis Etienne. So why not? Ha- you have a thousand yard rusher on the bench. Like why not bring him in? Especially when you know one, it's not costing you a whole lot. Only five hundred thousand dollars to see the rest of the season. And two, he's a restricted free agent after the season. So you can keep them if you want to. You can also flip them for another pick too, because you're going to have Brees Hall and still Michael Carter on the roster. Like so, it's a win-win situation for the Jets, and I think it signals that they're serious. They they're going for it. I mean, at five and two, they believe this team has an opportunity to get to the playoffs and you know possibly do some things, especially uh, with the way their defense is playing. Yeah, impressive and exciting. I will say, having been at that game in Jacksonville, Robinson did get a carry. It might have been in the second quarter. It looked like he got. I don't know if he got banged up or his bell rung or whatever. I mean, he wasn't evaluated or anything, but he kind of came off the field very slowly. I mean, the reason ETN played as much as he did was because he was killing the Giants. I mean, there's no yeah. reason not to, but I, I did think Robinson kind of took a beating on the few touches he did get, but obviously, you know, physicals and all that is a part of the trade process. So um, he can clearly help the Jets. Now, you mentioned they're going for it. That's exciting, but. When Elijah Moore steps out and requests a trade in the middle of the team having success, I think that opened everybody's eyes to say, well, wait a second, here we go, here we go again. This is going to be what gets the team off the rails. How have you seen the Jets respond internally and externally to uh, some of that drama and kind of distraction there? Well, I think they're putting their arm around Elijah Moore. I think they're not necessarily uh, alienating him. They understand his frustration. They understand that you know, the passing game hasn't been what they would want it to be or nor what he want would like to be as far as touches. But at the same time, they, they're they saying they're not going to trade him. He's still a bit part of their offense, and he's going to get his touches. And it might start this week, especially with Corey Davis, uh, his game step. He might be questionable uh, for the game against the Patriots. So, I mean, they really could have used him last week against Denver, to be honest with you, especially when, you know, Corey Davis left the game because they kind of left him you know, a little shorthanded at the wide receiver position. But, you know, I think now uh, 
they're they're going to find ways to get him the football. To be honest with you, and you, know, you have to think that you know, especially as the season goes on, teams are going to start to key in more on the running back position, and that's going to allow the Jets are going to have to open it up with the passing game, whether they want to or not. And Elijah Moore, along with Garrett Wilson and Corey Davis, are going to be a big part of that. Do you think their run heavy approach will take a major hit with Vera Tucker out? Or do you think they can keep that identity without him? I think I think it I don't think it will so long as they can get one George Fant back, which will you know, it doesn't seem like they will this week. But also uh Max Mitchell, a rookie uh who they took out of Louisiana, he was playing really well at the left tackle position. So crazy enough, they actually have some kind of depth once they get people back healthy. Now obviously Vera Tucker was like the MVP of their offensive line. I mean, he played three different positions this year, you know, left tackle, right tackle, and right guard, which is just Unhurt is insane. Like to have all this a lot, like played that many positions in one year, or, or even in their career, might quite frankly. But That's you know, nuts. I think obviously, you know, it, it hurts losing a guy like that because I think he was playing at a Pro Bowl level. But I think they're fine considering the depth that they're going to have coming back this year. If the Giants didn't trade back and take Kadarius Tony and get that extra first from the Bears, Vera Tucker was going to be Dave Gettleman's pick. You know, once all the receivers. Yeah, actually, but it got that came. right. I mean, that would have been a heck of a pit for him. <laughs> yeah, no, that that actually would have worked out, right? Um, I wanted to ask you this too about more the offense in general. Like, I look at this offense, Antoine, and I'm not around the team every day like you are, but I was skeptical of this before the season. You know, I was when everyone was saying Joe Flacco, how well he was playing, how the offense almost looked better with him. I think this is a better team with Joe Flacco. Zach Wilson scares me to death back there. And now, especially, they lose Vera Tucker. They lose Brees Hall. Yeah, they 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 bring in Robinson. They're going to try to stick to their identity. But do you think you can solve a lot of problems here, including Moore's frustrations not getting the ball, and maybe even be a better offense if Joe Flacco goes back in at quarterback? Or am I stirring up the pot where I don't need to here? I actually saw you were talking to Chris Canty about that. <laughs> yes, and, that was that, uh, what was funny. I we talked about it last week, and the, you know it it only reinforced the injuries and kind of the changes that have to happen now. Only kind of reinforced it, and um, so I wanted to ask you too because you're much closer to it than I am. I think. I mean. I- there are good and bad things with, you know, having Flacco in there. Like obviously Flacco has a lot more experience and knowledge of the offense and, you know, throwing the ball is obviously a, uh, Flacco is a little bit more uh, expert in that too. But what you lose and, you know, having Flacco back there is like mobility. Like he can't move at all. So, you know, you have any kind of pass rusher coming back there. You're like, like he's a sitting duck. And I think we kind of saw that in the first three weeks of the season. With, and also, he was also turning the ball over where I feel like Zach Wilson, you know, for better or worse, at least right now, he's not necessarily turning the ball over, which I think is good. That's one of the bright, that's one of the good spots of him. It was something that he didn't, he did a lot of last year at times where he turned the ball over, especially against the Patriots, ended up throwing four interceptions and in that loss against the New England, against New England. But right, you know, right. I, I think, you know, they, he definitely needs to take another step in this, pa- if his passing game is going to continue to develop. Um, I think they got to take a little bit of the handcuffs off of him. I feel like some of it is play calling. I think some of it is him not necessarily seeing the field very well. There, mm. I, I will say this: the receivers definitely responded a lot better with Joe Flacco back there. Uh, maybe because they had a little bit more chemistry with him, especially the amount of time they spent with him in training camp when Zach Wilson was dealing with his injuries. But you know, the fact of the matter is. I, if no matter who you put back there, you, you're going to lose something. Uh, so yeah. it, obviously I, I think they're just going to ride with Zach and hope he can get it together and continue to develop and uh, to help that passing game get him get better. No, that's great insight. The one thing concerns me, you're right, absolutely right, of course, about Flacco not being mobile. What what I was alarmed by against Denver, Denver's got a good defense, but oh, yeah. when Wilson's mobile – it, being mobile is great, but being mobile and reckless is not. And he looked reckless and um, like he was being mobile without a plan. Not Again, it's not easy, but that almost – I was stepping back looking at some of those plays, like the one where he fumbled but he was down but it, yeah. and he's spinning around. It looks like when I play Madden and the, the, you know, the computer sends pressure and I just bail <laughs> yeah. out, you know. It's yes. a, like you said about sealing the field – seeing the field – you have to be able to, in Zach Wilson's position, 
you're going to have three or four or five snaps a game where that pressure is going to come and being mobile is great, but you need to stand and deliver, even if it's going to mean taking a hit. And I, I, do you think he's capable of doing those things more strategically and smartly? Or do you, do you think that when we, what we saw against Denver is maybe what we'll continue to see against uh, complicated schemes? I think I think what, that's just kind of who he is. Like I, I think there's certain quarterbacks in the league, and you know this, that always make bonehead play. It might be like one or two a game, but they yeah. make they tend to make boneheaded type plays. I think that's just kind of what he's gonna do. Like he's gonna make plays where you just sit there and scratch your head and like, like what is he doing? Like, <laughs> like and that was one of them. I'm like, like whoa, dude, you could have cost your team <laughs> like a touchdown there, and and right. a game like that where. You know, points were coming at a premium. Like that could have been it right there. Like they could have been the, the um, the city, that could have been just, like with them winning or losing. Like he so. also had the one where he rolled left in the second half. It was a, kind of a broken play. It wasn't like a design run. Yeah, and he didn't have anything, and it was a clear throwaway situation. And he put his head down and like lowered his shoulder into two defensive linemen for like a two yard loss. I just, I just don't just understand it. Yeah, sometimes yeah, right. you gotta throw it away, man. Like I'm just like, okay. And we talked, we asked him about that, and we also asked Robert Sala about that. I think Zach's with the um, answer was like, I'm trying to make something happen, so I don't necessarily want to throw the ball away. But also, if it's like first to second down, sometimes I mean, just throw the ball away. You still have other downs left to play with. Like one, you don't want to get yourself hurt. Like kind of like what happened in the preseason, and two. Yeah, you don't want something disaster to strike. And like I said, the Jets offense been struggling at times, especially in the passing game. You definitely don't want to do something reckless or, you know, yeah. or just boneheaded like that. Another another thing that concerned me, well, drawing on my experience covering Daniel Jones so closely, last year when Garrett when Jason Garrett was his offensive coordinator and in 2020, especially last year, Jones started really kind of cutting down his turnovers. Part of the reason, though, was because, as you said so well, they kind of protected him from himself. You know, like the Jets, if Wilson's not turning the ball over as much, as you said, it's kind of they're trading fewer turnovers for fewer big plays because they're they're right. basically scheming less chances, taking fewer risks. And so I wonder about the Elijah Moore receivers offense, how it's functioning. It's great if he's turning the ball over less, but would you agree with me that if he if they keep the handcuffs on him and they stay conservative that it could create a lot more friction as far as how the offense is functioning and how the receivers are feeling about the offense than if they have a Flacco guy who is, you know, maybe makes a mistake here or there but is giving you the ball and giving you a chance to make plays? Yeah, at some point you're just going to have to take the handcuffs. You just got to throw the ball down the field and teams are going to scheme against that, especially they're trying to figure out ways to beat the Jets, and they understand that you know they're they're only going to throw it like five or ten yards down the field. They're not going to throw it down there because they have the handcuffs on Zach Wilson, and they're scared Amazing. that he's going to you know do something crazy. But you know, I can sometimes I can live with like if you throw the ball like 25, 30 yards and you get an interception, I can live with that at times because that's kind of that's sort of like a punt in a way, especially if it happens early in the game. You're just like okay, you know, you're just talking up, especially if you know. If you're try, if you see something, you know that might be potentially open. But it eventually, yeah, you can't just keep doing these, you know, short yardage plays. Yeah, you're gonna have to, you know, open it up and keep defenses honest, especially when you know your identity is trying to run the football because you don't want to deal with these seven or eight man fronts there that are not gonna be scared to, you know, <laughs> deal with you right. in the passing game. So yeah, it's something they're gonna have to think about, especially as the season goes on. When you play, you got two games against Buffalo. Got a game against the Vikings, you know. Obviously, you got you know games still left against the Miami Dolphins too and the Patriots. So yeah, that's something they're definitely gonna have to uh, consider. Who's a Jets player right now who is not getting the attention of a Sauce Gardner, but has really impressed you? I like DJ Reed. I think DJ Reed has been a huge addition, a huge signing for them coming over from Seattle. I think that a lot that's allowed Sauce Gardner to be able to develop. I think partly as quickly as what he has, but also been able to um to play different receivers and play a certain side where 
you know, I think a lot of rookie corners come in uh, kind of like with a, a chicken with his head cut off and just kind of running around the field. And I think with Sauce, he's just allowed him to be able to have this, you know, quiet confidence that one, you know, the other side of the field is going to be good. But also, like, I, it, I, I can just focus on doing my job and then everything's going to be all right. So I think uh, DJ Reed is one. Also, I think CJ Mosley you know, has always just been consistently really good you know you can count on him for 10 tackles per game and really mm-hmm. the leader one of the leaders of that defense and of course Quentin Williams I mean Quentin Williams has been playing out of his mind I mean mm-hmm. I think people are comparing him to AD like Aaron Donald and Chris Jones right now so that's that's the kind of level he's been on it's interesting actually you know Dexter Lawrence and Quentin Williams the interior defensive lineman for the Giants and Jets really have both been like the spearheads of you know excellent play, not only for their defenses, but also like you said, are just getting highlighted as top tier guys now. Um, yeah. You know, guys and, and that, I was going to say real quick too. And like, it's crazy that I think the Giants and Jets are both playing really good defense. Like the defenses are really good, but they're doing it in different ways. Like, especially as we, you know, we talk about this, like test you know, like the other day, like Wink Martindale's, you know, blitzes a lot more than what Robert Sala and the Jets like to do too as well. But you know, both of them have been exceptional. And I think Kayvon Thibodeau has been playing really, really well, especially recently there for the G-Man. He's turning it up. Why, big picture, get you out of here on this. Um, you know, Robert Sala has now taken the Jets into Lambeau in one. They've gone to Mile High in one. And it, early in the season, preseason, you know, leading up to this, there were just so many reasons, valid reasons, to question whether the program was taking hold, uh, whether Salah's plan and his structure and his scheme were going to work. How come everything has clicked for them? And obviously, it's still early in the season, but why has Salah's culture and program come together and produced results now for the Jets? You remember the receipts comment, like after the, they lost to the Ravens and then he's like, I'm taking receipts. And this team has rallied behind that. And then I've talked to multiple uh-huh. players about this on and off the record. Like they're like, we got dolls in this room. Like we are, we believe that like they they were excited when he said that because they, a lot of people were saying they're the same Jets and this team's going to win four or five games. And like this team truly believes like it's good and then they can go very far. And to have a coach to come out there and be, you know, outspoken about that, saying like, "Look, we're 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 not the same team. We're we're much better as a roster. We're much better. You know, have a program going. We're building a culture, and the players are really buying in that. And uh, whether or not it's going to continue the rest of the season remains to be seen. But the players have really continued to rally around Salah and believe in what he's selling, at least right now. And it seems like to, right now it seems like it's working out for him." Man, I did not realize that had such a kind of a hold on the locker room in such a positive oh, yeah. way. It's funny, like in the you know in the NFL, it's like twenty four hour news cycle. Something's the story of the day, and then a week later, sometimes you forget about it because something else is top of mind. But uh, that's a really interesting thread you tie there between kind of Salah's rally, you know, uh, stamp stumping for his team, and then how they're performing. And I, I should ask you this too. I mean, obviously they've. I think they've lost 12 straight to the Patriots as a, as an organization. Why can they win this game? Why, why can they beat this Patriots team? And do you, do you think it'll happen? Well, one, I don't think this Patriots team is very good. I think that's one, first and foremost. And uh, two, I think the Jets have, you know, they have a great defensive line. You know, like we talked about Quentin Williams, Carl Lawson's been playing really well too, as well. The Patriots have some issues on the old line. Obviously, People talk about the quarterback situation, whether, you know, it be Zappy or Matt Jones playing, you know, whoever the, whoever the case may be. I, I saw a team that really doesn't have a – like, doesn't know what they want to do, like, as far as the Patriots. Like, they wanted to run the ball with Stevenson there. They weren't able to do that against the Bears, too. Like, we saw the Jets be able to slow down both A.J. Dillon and Aaron Jones in Lambeau Field. If they can do something mm. like that against the Patriots, who a team that has an identity that wants to run the football, and you know, obviously the Jets running the football themselves, I, I think I don't see any reason why they can't beat the Patriots and go to six and two. Which is, again, I'm trying to wrap my mind around this. Like <laughs> six and two, like I don't think anybody necessarily saw this coming. But you wow. know, I, I have to. I keep telling people, I'm like, I, I didn't think this team would make the playoffs, and now I have to make, really consider the fact that 
both me and you might be covering playoff games in January. It's out of control. Daily News better get that budget together, Antoine. Hey, yes. thank you so, <laughs> thank you so much for uh, coming back again. And listen, as you just said, based on how this season's going, you're going to be coming on here again and again. I hope because there's going to be no shortage of storylines and victories. It seems to talk about with the Jets and the Giants. So thanks again for coming, man. All right, welcome back to Talking Ball with Pat Leonard. We're going to get into the two minute drill with my picks against the spread. Nine and five. In week seven, improving to 56, 51, and one overall so far this season. I pick every game every week. 52% essentially success rate so far have had two weeks in the last three, nine and 11 wins respectively. So stick right here and we're going to get right into some of my favorite picks. Go on Friday every week to my Instagram page. You'll see all of my picks posted in gold with a best bet for the play of the week. Now we're going to start this week with the Patriots minus one and a half at the Jets. I understand the Jets are five and two and the Patriots are three and four coming off an awful loss to the Chicago Bears where nothing looked the way anybody thought it would, including me losing my best bet, thinking the Patriots would cover easily against Justin Fields and the Bears. But the Patriots have beaten the Jets 12 straight times, haven't lost to them since 2015. They have covered this spread easily, essentially, in all of those games. That includes games with Tom Brady and without Tom Brady. Um, And the Patriots defense also has forced 13 takeaways, which is tied for third in the entire NFL. And Zach Wilson looked extremely shaky against Denver. And if he continues to play quarterback for the Jets, I think this is exactly the kind of game where with the injuries they've had, and with Wilson maybe needing to shoulder a little bit more of the offensive burden, that could spell disaster for the 5-2 and two Jets. Now moving to the London game, Jaguars minus three against the Denver Broncos. The wheels are coming off for the Broncos, first of all. Uh, Bradley Chubb reportedly could be traded if they lose the game. Uh, this is the arguably the most disappointing team in the league given expectations preseason and now what we've seen in Nate Hackett's first year. Uh, I also talked to some NFL players recently with the Giants going over to play in London. And one thing that came back to me, a couple of them said to me, do not play the Jaguars in London. Why? Well, because they're London and England's home team, essentially. This is their ninth time playing there. They play there every year. And logistically, they have the trip figured out. Like teams, players who have played the Jaguars over in London said, it's like clockwork. The organization has everything set. There's no concerns. It feels like a home game for them. And so I think that you look at this game against a team in Denver who is struggling mightily, no Russell Wilson, who wasn't playing well anyway, against the Jaguars team that some of the Giants defensive players were telling me in the locker room after beating Jacksonville, this team has a ton of talent. And they volunteered that information. They've played all these teams so far. They've played seven games. And the Giants defensive players kind of were really heaping praise on the amount of talent, especially on the offensive side of the ball that Jacksonville has. Um, The Jags are two and five against the spread. So are the Broncos though. And I love the Jacksonville Jaguars to cover this game. It might end up being my best bet of the week. Now, a mea culpa. Giants plus three at the Seahawks. This opened at two and a half. And now it has ballooned to plus three. The Giants are tired of being underdogs, tired of hearing that they're underdogs. But it's fascinating that they're six and one and that they still become underdogs. Now, obviously, Seattle's not an easy place to play. You think of a three point line that essentially means that if they played on a neutral field, that the lines makers believe that it would be a pick 'em. And so this isn't total disrespect, but from my standpoint, I'm done picking against the Giants. I picked them to cover in London. They win in London against the Packers. Should have learned my lesson there that week that, listen, I was losing too many. I was taking too many L's picking against the Giants. Sure enough, I go against them against the Ravens. They win that game. I go against them in Jacksonville. They win that game. So I am done picking against the Giants until they lose one of these games. Not even that they don't cover it, until they lose one of these games. And so um, give me the Giants at plus three at Seattle covering that, even though the Seahawks have been playing well, and this is the Geno Smith revenge game. Of course, the Giants six and one against the spread. I, I just have to, I just have to pick 
big blue right now. It's it's just, you know, you're crazy if you're not, I think. And then my final pick that I'm going to give out this week right here on Talking Ball is the Bengals minus three at the Browns. Division games are tricky. They're dangerous, unpredictable. Uh, but I I felt like I saw the Bengals outburst and eruption coming against the Falcons last week. They have struggled a little bit early in the season to figure out who they are, but it looks like they're rounding into form, finding a little bit more of their identity. And Cleveland is starting to slip. Kareem Hunt's name has gotten mentioned as a player who could get possibly moved. Obviously, they are counting later in the season on Deshaun Watson coming back after his dis- suspension. But the Browns, I think the bloom is off the rose on them being able to kind of hold the fort right now. And the Bengals are looking more like the playoff team and Super Bowl contender that they were last year, especially with a defense led by Lou Anarumo, the defensive coordinator, uh, that continues to give them a chance to win or to blow teams out like they did against the Falcons. Uh, so those are my picks this week. The Cincinnati, by the way, five and two against the spread. Keep that in mind. Uh, FanDuel, DraftKings, uh, Barstool Sportsbook, BetMGM, Superbook. You all know where to find me. I mean, I'm leading the Daily News pick standings again. And everybody listening to this podcast, as I've said every week, it I really appreciate you tuning in. And one thing that would really help me continue to grow this community at Talking Ball is if you would like and subscribe and review, whether it be on my YouTube page, on the podcast page, on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you're listening, or even on the Believe YouTube page where my videos get clipped and used there, as well, obviously, on TikTok and Instagram and Twitter where I am present. But the reviews and the likes really help grow and show people that the content we're bringing you, the guests we're bringing you, and the insight we're bringing you is going to be consistent and is going to go a long way to informing you not only in this season, but in the off season as well as we know the NFL is round the clock. So thanks for joining me as always. We will see you next time on Talking Ball with Pat Leonard.